Hello. We'd like to today to, dis to discuss cell culture contamination and prevention. Some of the goals of today's talk uh, will, will be to discuss some of the types of contamination, to suggest methods that will help reduce uh, the contamination occurrences. So there's many types of contamination um, out there, right, from chemical, uh, non-viable to viable biological contaminants. And um, non-viable, of course, would be non-living contaminants. Viable contaminants might be things like viruses, uh, mycoplasma, prions, things like that that might affect your culture. Um, <clears throat> examples of possible uh, contaminants that might come from chemical could be things like plasticizers, dirty glassware, uh, disinfectant residue, cleaning residues, impurities from gas, chemical changes due to light exposure. So all of these things actually can affect the way your cells uh, will grow in culture. Now, some contaminations are very easy to detect, like uh, molds or yeast or bacteria. You can see those with your naked eye or possibly a microscope. But then there's some other uh, more difficult to detect contaminants, such as viruses, protozoa, mycoplasma, or so forth. And these may be difficult to detect uh, with a microscope. And in some cases, you need an electron, electron microscope to uh, even see such contaminations such as virus or mycoplasma. But I will mention that there are other uh, morphological attributes or pathological at attributes that you might detect, say, viruses, uh, viral contamination with. So some of the strategies to reduce contamination, of course, one would be good laboratory practices where we're, uh, we're aware of the mechanisms by which exposure can occur. We're uh, aware of the risks associated with the material we use. We understand the limitations, say, of biological safety cabinets, that they're only class 100 hoods. They're not sterile. They're just very clean. And of course, we want to use procedures and techniques that reduce the potential and use continual vigilance. Constant vigilance is really important. I like to recommend to my students that they look under the microscope frequently, understand how to use your phase contrast microscope, understand what it looks like uh, when your cells are seen under phase contrast uh, uh, compared to uh, loss of phase contrast. General practices, I think it's really important to, as I said, to use vis visual uh, microscopy to look at your cells. It's real important to grow cells in antibiotic-free media. I'd recommend not sharing media. And uh, one of the things we've learned, of course, is that cell culture media should not be exposed to light. Light will do damage to your media. It creates oxidative stress, which destroys amino acids and proteins and vitamins. But at the same time, media is never, so shown, uh, never sold in dark bottles because people like to inspect their media before they use, uh, use it. And they like to shake their bottle around to look for particulate matter that might be in the bottle. I do want to stress, though, that all particulate m matter is not bad. Some particulate matter may be expected to build up in media over time. Um, and these might be things like serum proteins and what have you that might come out of solution. It's also really important to learn how to use your microscope, how to sit there comfortably with both eyes open. Uh, the two panels below show a uh, 293 culture that is contaminated with E. coli. And I want to stress that it's really important to begin to look for contamination before your cells get highly confluent. The place to look for contamination is between the cells. Once your cells are confluent, it becomes very difficult to see. Uh, the panel on the right-hand side is a blow-up of the little square that you'll see on the left-hand panel. The size of the right-hand panel would be about 100 microns on each side of that little square. And this is a blow-up of that little square we see in the left-hand panel. Each uh, side of the panel on the right side is 100 microns. And there you can see the E. coli. So it's very important to look closely uh, and use a high-powered microscope if possible. Look between your cells. Um, if you have a 
significant contamination and your media has phenol red, you might notice that the media becomes yellow. That's because the E. coli grow so rapidly, they deplete the oxygen from the culture. Everybody in the culture grows anaerobically. They produce a lot of CO2 and, um, and, um, and uh, acid, and the acid turns the culture media uh, uh, yellow, and that's because the cells are growing anaerobically. If you have a significant culture, you might notice your media becomes a little bit turbid or cloudy. Um, and oftentimes, when you open up an incubator, you can smell the contamination uh, pretty readily. Uh, we're looking at some baby hamster kidney cells here. On the left-hand panel, we're looking at uncontaminated cells. On the right-hand panel, we're looking at contaminated cells. The cells that are uh, contaminating the animal culture are pretty large for bacteria. So uh, they're really pretty easy to see in this panel. But one of the things I want to point out, you can look if you can see if you look closely, is the morphological deterioration that's associated uh, with the bacterial contamination. So strategies to reduce con uh, contamination: work in a clean uh, area, uh, have that area isolated from di disturbances. We don't like to see a lot of people walking around. Um, behind us when we're doing cell culture. When we're sitting in the cell culture biological safety cabinet, we don't want to do a lot of side-to-side -side movements, say turning your body side-to-side -to, -side to grab pipettes and then turning your body to swing the pipettes back into the uh, biological safety cabinet. We'd rather have our hands move slowly, uh, in a direction that's perpendicular to the to the biological safety cabinets. We'd like to be the room to be free from drafts. We don't want a lot of activity. Of course, we never do any animal or microbial work in the biological safety cabinets. We want to keep that room clean and dust free. We want to keep the work surface clean and uncluttered because the biological safety cabinet works mostly by uh, airflow. Here's an example of mycoplasma contamination. Again, the important point there, I think, is that most people don't assay for mycoplasma contamination as much as they should. This is particularly true in the academic world. Uh, mycoplasma can sneak up on you. They divide very, very slowly. They uh, compete for nutrition in the animal cells. Um, you can have a mycoplasma contamination and not really know it because you can't see the mycoplasma with the naked eye or under the microscope. Um, so it's, it's difficult to uh, detect. One of the ways you can detect uh, mycoplasma is by using something like a mycofluor. This is a fluorescent stain. Uh, in this case here on the far left-hand panel, we can see uninfected cells, and that would be the nucleic acids of the non-contaminated animal cells that are fluorescing. In the panel in the center, in the panel on the right-hand side, you can see mycoplasma. This is called a punctate staining, and what you can see is the little specks of fluor around the nucleus uh, in the center or on the left hand, on the right hand side, you can see some spotty fluorescent staining, and this is an indication of the mycoplasma that are on the surface of the animal cells. I also want to point out that um, you can do some of these tests in less than an hour using the mycofluor. MycoSeq is a detection method that's an alternative, and this would be a PCR based multiplex primer. Uh, design-based system for real-time PCR uh, to detect and quantitate the amount of um, mycoplasma contamination in a culture. Um, these are typically should be routinely done uh, for anybody that's doing cell culture, especially if you're going to apply a product uh, based on your cell culture. I also want to point out that you can kill mycoplasma by using some of the various antibiotics that are listed here. But they're really difficult uh, on the cells, and the best thing to do would be to discard your cells and get a new batch of cells that are non-contaminated. So mycoplasma are slow to grow and difficult to detect. Uh, some of the signals you might get uh, to indicate contamination might be things like 
Uh, if you were good and did a growth curve of your culture and you know your cell doubling time, you might notice that the doubling time has increased. Uh, you might notice that the confluency of your cells uh, at high confluency, the number of cells you get have decreased. One of the things that happens when a cell is stressed is that it gets larger. And so if you think that the cells are larger due to their contamination, there would be fewer cells at confluency. You might notice that your cells at one time were very easy to detach from the plastic matrix and you could trypsinize or whatever and you could get nice individual cell population. But maybe you notice now that the cells are aggregating together and it's difficult to, to get the clumps of cells apart. Um, that might be an indication of uh, mycoplasma uh, contamination. Uh, other things like reduced transfection efficiency, morphological deterioration might also be signs. Uh, one of the things that happens is that mycoplasma does contain cholesterol in its cell membrane, and based, uh, because of that, it's possible that the mycoplasma can actually embed into the cell membrane and form kind of a scaffold over the cell, making, it, uh, making them aggregate, making them have, uh, take longer to divide, and that sort of thing. Yeast contamination may be another possibility that you need to worry about. Uh, unlike uh, bacterial contamination or mycoplasma contamination, yeast contamination may be easier to spot. Yeast are significantly bigger. We can see the arrowheads in this image are pointing to some of the yeast, and you can see that those contaminants are much bigger than the animal, are much bigger than E. coli. So easier to spot with a microscope. Uh, uh, there may or may not be a change in the media color if the media contains phenol red. Um, sometimes yeast contaminations don't, most of the time there is not a color change. Sometimes the color change may actually be, uh, the media may become kind of a purple color if it's got phenol red because yeast contaminations often make the media pH a little more alkaline as opposed to acidic. Uh, finally, I just want to point out here that uh, other types of fungal contamination, I showed you just a minute ago some pictures of yeast, but here's some other types of fungal contamination you might recognize. On the left-hand side is a mycelium. Uh, this often you'll see, not with the naked eye, but you can see this under the microscope, and it may look like somebody has actually taken and scored your plastic growth surface with an X-Acto knife or something like that. Um, and you can see the, that's the sexual form of the, of the fungi. And then over on the right-hand panel, you see one of those big fungal contaminations um, in, a, in a T75 dish. In the event that you do have a contamination or you choose to grow yourselves uh, with antibiotics part of the time or all the time, uh, that's not something I recommend, but here's some of the antibiotics that people might use and why they work. Uh, I ha have highlighted the antibiotic anti-anti, which is the antibiotic antimycotic, spen uh, penicillin, streptomycin, and fungisone. That's probably the most widely used antibiotic, antimycotic uh, out there right now and does work pretty well. Again, uh, good cell cultures, though, does not grow their cells in antibiotics. Certainly, they don't do it all the time. And then finally, I want to mention that if you ever do have a contamination, the best thing you could do is follow my best practices and have cells frozen away that you can easily get to regrow your cells, cells that have been frozen, uh, verified, certified that they're contamination-free. Um, if you do need to contaminate, you need to disassociate your cells, count them, dilute them out in antibiotic-free media. Uh, you'd like to maybe look to determine which uh, concentrations of antibiotics might work. You want to grow cells at lower than the toxic levels of antibiotics for multiple passages. Then it's typical that you might grow your cells for multiple passages without antibiotics. The idea is any any contamination that wasn't inhibited or killed by the antibiotics would begin to grow again, and then you would repeat the steps again using antibiotics and then grow the cells with the antibiotics. People may typically alter the antibiotic they use every several passages, 
and you would keep doing that until your cells are contamination free. But realize that this is really not the best thing to do. Uh, this could result in an you know, irreversible change in your culture. The best thing to do is to grow cells uh, antibiotic free, uh, learn what good technique is, sort of take your knocks early, learn what works, and then move forward. It's, it's best not to use antibiotics if possible. And then finally, I just want to show you a biological safety cabinet setup. Um, this would be pretty much for a right-handed person. You can see I have my aspirator there that I'd be using for aspirating media. Uh, there would be a vacuum flask to hold the contaminated media, the biohazard waste. Uh, that flask might have 10% bleach or some visphene or something like that in it there to kill the contamination in that contaminated waste. I'd want to probably bring the pipettes that I might need for the work I'm going to do in the biological safety cabinet. I've also got some kind of a solid waste container to hold my solid waste tips and so forth. And then if you'll notice when I work, I like to place my bottles and my tubes or whatever in the very back of the biological safety cabinet. I like to make sure that the caps are loose in my bottles before I try to use them. I like to put the bottles in the biological safety cabinet in the order that I'm going to use them. For example, if I was going to trypsinize cells, I'd have the balanced salt solution, and then I would have the, the, the digestion enzyme, and then I would have the bottle of media with the serum to kill the enzyme. So I could pick, pull one bottle forward, use it, push it aside. Also notice that I have a clean area in the center where I'm working with a dirty area on either side. If I'm a right-handed person, the dirty area on the right-hand side would primarily be to protect myself against inevitable drips. Uh, I might put a sterile gauze pad or a gauze pad with some alcohol down in that area. And that's where I would hold my pipette and allow any drips from, say, a 25 or a 50 mil pipette to occur. If I keep track of that area where dripping occurs, I won't put my hand in the drips. I won't put media or flasks in that dirty area. The clean area is, is the area directly in front of me. That's where I want to place my flask. That's where I want to do my work, and I want to clean it up between cell lines between bottles or whatever. And then, of course, I have a dirty area on my far left side where I might put used serological pipettes and so forth. So this is kind of a typical setup that I might want to use. I'm a right-handed person, so you could just switch things around if you're left-handed. But I find this works for me. One of the things that I think people have the biggest problem with is not keeping a large enough clean area in front of them, not loosening bottle caps, and uh, finally, probably having things in both hands and then needing a third hand in order to grab a flask or something. So think about what you're doing. Try to keep your caps loose, the area in front of you clean, and think about what you're going to do so you have an available hand that you can grab things for. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you.